Good morning. It's seven o'clock. You're watching the only breakfast show live from Westminster. Boris Johnson will be rolling up his sleeves to receive his first COVID jab today. But has he done enough to allay concerns about an expected shortage of the AstraZeneca vaccine next month? And could coronavirus certificates be the key to allowing us to return en masse to sporting events and concerts this summer? The Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden seems to think so. He'll be joining us shortly. Also this morning, blooming marvellous. With more of us enjoying outdoor spaces in lockdown, we'll talk to the National Trust about their initiative to get people snapping the spring blooms. And let's have it large. A music marathon for the mind. We'll speak to the DJ who's going to be raising money for mental health charities with a 40-hour set starting from tonight. It's Friday, the 19th of March. Under pressure but standing firm, Nicola Sturgeon criticises a leaked report which says she misled the Scottish Parliament. What's been clear is the opposition members of this committee uh, made their minds up about me before I uttered a single word of evidence. She has breached the ministerial code on numerous occasions. She cannot continue, you cannot continue with that doubt of trust. Also this morning, a new study suggests vaccinations alone are unlikely to contain COVID infections in the UK, as the Prime Minister prepares to have his jab later today. A raft of European countries to resume the AstraZeneca rollout as 16 regions of France prepare to go back into lockdown. Workplace warnings calls for more support for vocational students as job prospects suffer due to the pandemic. Making waves with whales. The sound monitoring devices aimed at preventing the marine mammals from being struck by large vessels. And a fair amount of cloud around for today with some drizzle, but some places will see blue skies and sunshine as well. So a little bit of everything in the forecast. I'll have the details for you later in the programme. Good morning. Nicola Sturgeon has criticised a leaked report which found that she misled the Scottish Parliament. Sky News understands that Holyrood's Harassment Committee has reached the conclusion by a majority vote ahead of the publication of its final report. The First Minister says she stands by the evidence she gave, but her opponents are calling for her resignation. Our Scotland correspondent, James Matthews, reports. This was Nicola Sturgeon last night, having just heard the verdict from Holyrood, that she, its First Minister, had misled Parliament. This was her first reaction. Uh, well, I think the first thing to say is I stand by all of the evidence I gave to the committee, all eight hours worth of evidence. I mean, what's been clear is the opposition members of this committee uh, made their minds up about me before I uttered a single word of evidence. Their public comments have made that clear. So this leak from the committee, very partisan leak uh, tonight, before they've actually finalised the report, is not that surprising. From the court of a parliamentary committee, the verdict was by majority against its First Minister. It concluded that she misled them about a meeting with Alex Salmon three years ago. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. When she said that she hadn't offered to intervene in a government investigation into complaints against him, they'd met along with his legal advisor, Duncan Hamilton. From the minute I saw the, the letter, I knew that it would not be appropriate for me to intervene. I probably was trying to, you know, soften that for him. Maybe from his accounts, I softened that too much. The committee agreed. Taking account of the competing versions of the event, the committee believes that she did in fact leave Alex Salmond with the impression that she would, if necessary, intervene. This is confirmed by Duncan Hamilton, who was also at the meeting. Her written evidence is, therefore, an inaccurate account of what happened and she has misled the committee on this matter. This is a potential breach of the ministerial code under the terms of section 1.3c. I don't want to prejudice the publication of the inquiry report, but if there is a misleading of the inquiry, that is extremely serious. And if the Hamilton inquiry finds breaches of the ministerial code based on principle, take out personality, take out party, the minister should resign. 
According to the ministerial code, ministers who knowingly mislead parliament are expected to resign. Holyrood's harassment committee didn't use the word knowingly when it concluded that Nicola Sturgeon had misled them. That may yet be a significant factor as she faces down calls for her resignation. We need to have faith that the First Minister is truthful. Uh, and if it is the case that the First Minister has misled Parliament, uh, as we believe she has, and she has breached the ministerial code on numerous occasions, she cannot continue. This Holyrood Inquiry Committee will deliver its full report next week. It isn't the only one that's looked at whether Nicola Sturgeon broke the ministerial code. There's another one in tandem that rose out of the controversy surrounding the Alex Salmond affair. Let's wait and see what the final reports have to say. Amidst talk of a potential resignation matter, on its conclusions hinge a matter of resignation. James Matthews, Sky News, Edinburgh. Now, could uh, so-called COVID certificates be the key to life getting back to normal? The Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, seems to think so, hoping the likes of Wembley Stadium can be filled again with fans for the Euro Championships this summer. I can speak to Mr Dowden now. Good morning to you. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment, but I wonder if first you can comment on our top story and the, the calls for the leader of the Scottish uh, Conservatives that Nicholas Sturgeon should leave now. Do you agree with those calls? Well, of course, I support our leader in Scotland and we're uh, clearly awaiting the full committee uh, report. But I think Douglas Ross has set out our position very clearly, yes. But you don't feel able to, to comment on whether she should resign now, bearing in mind that it has been found that she misled Parliament? Well, let's wait for the, the full committee uh, report to be uh, published and uh, Douglas Ross, uh, as our leader in Scotland, will be uh, responding uh, to that uh, in the, the appropriate way. I think really the, the choice facing people in, in Scotland in these elections is, do we get on and deal with COVID and the recovery or do we get stuck in yet more years of constitutional wrangling, which we thought we dealt with um, at the time of the Scottish referendum back in 2014? OK, let's look at your brief now. How are plans uh, shaping up for people being able to attend live events in the summer? Well, we've set out a, a really ambitious roadmap, which we're working very hard to deliver on. So uh, if all goes well and uh, vaccine remains on track as it is and we keep the disease under control, by the 17th of May, we'll be back to the sort of things that we saw last summer. So socially distanced performances, uh, indoor and outdoor. And then the big step forward will be on the 21st of June, which mean, which will be the point at which we want to get as much back as we possibly can. And I'm working really intensively to work on the safest way to do that. So I've already announced uh, pilots. For example, we're going to pilot at the FA Cup final. We're going to pilot at the Crucible. Uh, we're looking at how we can ensure in indoor and outdoor settings, how we can get as many people back as we possibly can and get back to the things we, we really love as a nation. Uh, you're quoted in the paper today as saying that you're confident fans can pour into Wembley with less or no social distancing for the Euros, and that's because of COVID certification. What, what exactly will be COVID certificates and what will that entail? Well, um, from the 21st of June, if, if all goes uh, to plan in the way that I described, we hope to get uh, people back in significant numbers. We're piloting the different things that will enable that to happen. Clearly, it will have to be done in a COVID secure way. So you would uh, expect and we'll be testing these things, things like uh, one way systems, things like masks, things like uh, hand hygiene and everything else. And as part of that, another thing that we are considering is a COVID certification and we'll be testing whether we can use COVID certification to help uh, facilitate the return of sports. Obviously final decisions have not been taken on that and I'm working with the Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove, who is leading on our COVID certification uh, work programme. But I think that is a potential but tool that could help the return of, of, of the things that we love. But well, what exactly will a COVID certificate be and, and how will that differ from a, a vaccine passport, say? I mean, people will want to know the minutiae of what a certificate will mean. Yeah, and we, we, are, um, we are working through those details. And we've already said that we'll, we've got a review. That review is ongoing and we'll, we'll publish the review. We've been clear that there won't be a vaccine uh, passport. The Prime Minister has um, made that very clear. What we have said, though, is that in order to 
to prove, uh, for example, that you've um, had a vaccine or that you've had a successful negative test, we'll, we're looking at ways to help facilitate proving that. And that may be one of the things that could help ensure that we can get more people back into stadiums. But remember, there's, there's sort of there's three tracks going on here at the, the, the same time. One and the most important thing of all is that we continue to control this disease. So that means everyone abiding by the rules is working, getting numbers down and the risk taking their vaccine when they get the, the call up to do so. And we're making good progress on that. Secondly, uh, the chance of the Duchy of Lancaster and others I'm, I'm helping alongside this is looking at different mitigations that we could use, including the, the COVID vaccine. Uh, certification and I'm also through but, but my how, how, how would somebody go about getting a COVID certificate how long would it last and and how would you police that they have actually gone through the right process to get the certificate yeah and look those, those are all entirely legitimate questions which is exactly why we have set up uh, this review and we're working through the challenges to get that right and what we said is that can potentially be a tool that will enable people to return but remember it will sit alongside other things to make places uh, safe like one-way systems like hand sanitizing and all of this is all predicated on getting the the vaccine rollout delivered and getting the disease under control because it's only if we do those things that we can even start considering the kind of large numbers of people returning that we so desperately want from the 21st of june in which i'm making my my number one mission i've been meeting uh, several times this week that's why we've got nick heitner a uh, very famous theatre producer, David Ross, working with many, many people to see how we can get people back safely in large numbers. Because if we don't manage to do it, if we don't manage to do it this summer, if we succeed with the vaccine rollout, if we succeed in getting the disease under control, I'm really worried about the future of those uh, industries that are so vital, not just to our sense of national well-being, but to the whole national economy. Uh, and do you envisage that there still will be social distancing? You're saying that you want to get the maximum people back into to Stadia, but will there be social distancing? Well, I, I hope we will be able to find ways of mitigating against certainly having the sort of social distancing that we have at the moment, because the sort of social distancing we have at the moment makes it very, very difficult, for example, for uh, theatre productions to be run profitably. It makes it very, very difficult for our football clubs to, um, to run profitably if you have to have those large distances between people. Now, clearly, we've been in a situation for the past year where we've had to have those distances. So we are proceeding with caution. That's why it's the last stage. That's why we are piloting different ways of mitigating against that. And uh, as we've discussed, one of the things that we are considering as part of that is COVID certification. Uh, and can you guarantee once open football stadia and the like will be able to remain open. We have heard from the scientists that when it comes to the, the winter months, we might have to start wearing masks again and then by implication, social distancing again. Well, that's why we are proceeding with caution because we really want these to be a permanent uh, reopenings. And one of the things that I know that frustrated people uh, last year was uh, not being able to have that, that sort of certainty. Obviously, as, as, as you and your viewers will appreciate, this terrible disease um, has uh, changed over time, but we will be, we'll be doing everything we can to ensure that it's, it's permanent. I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate that we, we can't foresee every um, last eventuality, but the, what we are doing is trying to get the conditions right so this, this will be a, a permanent uh, reopening. Um, I wonder what you make of the uh, University of Warwick's uh, modelling study that's out today, in which they say it's... Um vaccinating all adults in the UK is unlikely to achieve herd immunity and fully contain the virus? Well, uh, first of all, vaccination has a, a huge beneficial impact. It has a huge uh, beneficial impact for the people taking it. It's the best way to, to stop you uh, getting the disease. And once you've had two doses, it is highly effective. And certainly, if we, uh, as we get through the, the top uh, nine categories, and we're confident we'll do that by mid-April, we should see enormous reductions in hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, but the can you comment specifically on, on their line that it, it, yeah. it won't fully contain the virus? Um, well, the, the evidence is emerging on the effect of the vaccine on spread. So we, we don't know fully the picture. I think it will have a significant effect on spread, but no vaccine is going to be perfect. Of course not. You're not, you're not going to, by vaccine alone, uh, fully prevent the spread of the disease. But the, the sort of steps that we have outlined 
have in mind that uh, we sufficiently reduce hospitalizations, uh, reduce deaths, so that we can uh, live with this disease over the coming years. So the, we, there won't be an elimination of the, the disease, but we should get to a point where it is safe for most activities uh, to resume. And that, that is what the roadmap is all about. And on the vaccines, on, on the, the shortage, can you clarify exactly what the situation is with the, the, the lack of vaccines that are coming from India? Uh, well, I think the Prime Minister and the, the Chief Medical Officer and, and Health Secretary uh, addressed this yesterday. There has been a uh, delay uh, in respect to about 5 million doses from the, the Serum uh, Institute in India. They are doing a fantastic job and working as, as hard as they can. We always knew there were going to be uh, fluctuations in the vaccine, but we are confident on those landmarks to reopening that we are on the right track. So we got the most at risk people vaccinated uh, by the middle of February. By the middle of April, we want to get uh, all over 50s and uh, the most vulnerable um, vaccinated. We're confident we're on course for that. Once we've done that, we really will have a huge impact on reducing deaths and hospitalizations. And then by the end of uh, July, we're still on track for getting the rest of the adult population uh, vaccinated. So you, you would expect movements up and down a bit, but the, the overall trajectory, we're, we're very much on course for that. Oliver Dowden, Cultural Secretary, thank you very much for speaking to us this morning. Thank you. Still to come on the show, following three shootings in Atlanta, Georgia this week and a rise in hate crime against Asian people, we speak to the chair of End the Virus of Hate, Ruyu Tam, at quarter to eight. At five past eight, we'll discuss the latest on the potential shortage of vaccines with Imperial College London's vaccine lead professor, Robin Shattuck. And with more of us enjoying outdoor spaces in lockdown, we'll talk to the National Trust about their initiative to get people snapping the spring blooms. That's at 20 past eight. France, Italy and Germany are beginning to roll out the Oxford AstraZeneca jab again today after they reversed their decision to temporarily pause its use over blood clot concerns, with the European Medicines Agency confirming the vaccine is safe and effective. It comes as cases continue to rise across the continent in France. 16 areas, including the capital Paris, have entered new lockdown restrictions. Non-essential shops will close and inter-regional travel will be prohibited, but schools will remain open. Meanwhile, new research in The Lancet suggests vaccination alone is unlikely to contain coronavirus infections in the UK, but gradual reopening and high vaccine uptake could minimise future waves. Well, it comes as the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, will have his first dose of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine this afternoon as he continues to try and reassure people the jab is safe. And our political uh, correspondent, as you can see, Rob Powell, is uh, with me now. Uh, and Rob, um, how is the, the Prime Minister doing in that job of, of reassuring people that AstraZeneca is safe and also that the glitch in, in supply isn't really going to have an adverse effect? Yeah, there has been these two issues, hasn't there, over the last week over safety and supply. I think on safety, we heard from the Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, yesterday, saying that there was some anecdotal evidence of people cancelling appointments uh, that's thought to be on the back of some of the fears after the stories um, uh, around the AstraZeneca jab and what's been going on on the continent. But overall, he said, there was no evidence of any significant damage being done or any significant problem um, with uptake. Uh, and to re-emphasise that, we obviously had that press conference last night with the medicines regulator, but also Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, will be getting his jab. He's eligible now because he's in his 50s uh, today. And he has said he will be having the Oxford AstraZeneca jab because that's what they're using at the vaccination centre he's going to. Um, on supply, uh, actually on that as well, whilst it, it may be a little bit disheartening for some younger people, such as me maybe, who thought, well, they're checking their phone hopefully over the next <laughs> four to five weeks, thinking that you might get an early shout for a vaccine, it now looks likely that that won't happen, that under 50s will have to wait until May. But actually, if you look within the framework of the timetable the government has laid out, everyone getting a jab by the end of July, that doesn't seem to impact that too much. And the Prime Minister and the government have been pretty clear it won't impact the road um, out of lockdown. I think what is clear, though, and what came from that interview with Oliver Dowd and the Culture Secretary just then, uh, and what's come from that evidence from Warwick University today as well, 
is that the vaccine programme isn't going to make COVID go away. So even over the summer, there are not going to necessarily be maskless free-for-all events at sports stadiums. There may still be a need for hand sanitizer, for one-way systems, for masks, for even COVID certificates as well. So uh, a lot of work to do. And just because everyone may have been offered at least the vaccine by the end of the July, doesn't mean life going back to how it was before this all started. OK, Rob, thanks very much. Don't know if I should admit it, but I've had my first jab. I'm in that category. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's take a look at the other stories making the news now this morning. Brazil has recorded its second highest number of daily deaths from coronavirus. Official figures show 2,724 people died yesterday. It takes the total number of deaths there during the pandemic to more than 287,000. San Marino is treating its population with coronavirus vaccines from Russia. The landlocked microstate in Italy has been taking deliveries of the Sputnik V vaccines for several weeks. The nation has a deal to buy injections from the EU, but says it's been able to secure the Russia vaccine much sooner. The White House says it will reach its target of providing 100 million coronavirus vaccines weeks earlier than planned. President Biden says he'll outline new targets next week and he's also authorised plans to send millions of extra jabs to Mexico and Canada. We will not stop until we beat this pandemic. Next week, I will announce our next goal to put shots in arms. This is a time for optimism, but it's not a time for relaxation. I need all Americans, I need all of you to do your part Teachers and colleges say they're increasingly concerned about the job prospects for students taking vocational qualifications. The pandemic has paused many work placements and practical lessons have been disrupted by recent class closures. More than 40% of 16 to 18 year olds take a technical or vocational qualification. Laura Bunduk has been to the West Midlands to meet the teenagers facing an uncertain future. Make sure it's facing forward. This is as close as they'll get to flying. Holidays on hold, but classes continue. The life jacket. Welcome aboard the travel and tourism course at Hales Owen College near Birmingham. Students sat down, belted up and learning the ropes. Ella's dream is a job on cruise ships. I want to be in this industry so much like it's, um, it's really something I really want to do. But the pandemic's pushed back her plans. I might have to be sidetracked after I leave college next year, but um, it, the path is still there. Like I'm still, I'm still wanting to do what I want to go and work on cruise ships. So yeah, you're determined you will get there. <laughs> yeah, I'm determined I will get there. There's sharp determination in the college kitchens too. Alice is shaping up her skills. That's it, lovely. So She's training for a job in hospitality, but facing a jobs market that's anything but hospitable. It's quite weird now, but like, I'm just being hopeful that it'll all come back to normal soon. Everyone's going to want to go back to eating out and stuff, so I feel like it'll always be there. There's a different pressure on health and social care students. Their much needed skills make job prospects easier. It feels rewarding being able to do a qualification at the end of it, being able to help people, especially those in need, and especially in a sector where people are needed. Everyone's looking at health and social care at the moment because of how much they've been helping with the current situation, and I feel like it has definitely made me want to go into this. Vocational courses are studied by over 40% of 16 to 18 year olds, but practical learning and work placements have been lost, and that's worrying the government. It's also worrying those awarding the qualifications. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult, Laura. There's no two ways about it. There are going to be less opportunities out there for young people, and we've got to continue to invest in our future talent so that as the economy recovers, as the labour market recovers, we've got work-ready, job-ready people ready to come through. That means these students will need to be prepared. This is an emergency. Brace, brace. Getting brace, careers brace. off the Put ground could be a difficult journey. Down. Laura Bundock, Sky News, Hales Owen, near Birmingham. An education think tank claims it's found inconsistencies in the levels of support available to children with special educational needs in England. 
The Education Policy Institute says that access to services has become what it calls a postcode lottery. Well, our correspondent Ali Fortescue uh, joins us now uh, from the newsroom. Uh, and Ali, um, drill us into some of the detail of uh, what this, this report has found. Well, they looked at hundreds of thousands of children in a single year group over the course of their time at primary school. So they tracked them for a long period of time. And as you say, they show serious variation, inconsistencies in the level of access for children with special educational needs. But crucially, this was also about whether children with special educational needs were even identified in the first place as needing that support. So uh, children from more deprived parts of the country and children that went to academies were less likely to access that help, were less likely to be recognised as needing help and crucially this comes down to the school so it's not from the household that the pupil comes from it's from the school they go to the place where they are educated and the education policy institute called this a postcode lottery they said children are falling through the gaps have a listen to what one of their directors joe hutchinson had to say to us a little earlier on the system for funding of special educational needs and disabilities is really inconsistent and perhaps is not currently supporting schools to get this right. We need to have a conversation between schools and families to try to set out what are the sorts of reasonable adjustments that schools can make for children with special educational needs and disabilities. And their analysis suggested there were underlying problems there for children with special educational needs and disabilities there already before the pandemic, but this was exacerbated by the problems we all know have come for education over the course of the last 12 months, things like remote learning, making it harder for those children to be identified and get the help they need. Um, they say, the think tanks say, that the government needs to help provide more help, needs to get to grips with this, but they say for their part, the Department for Education, that they know, despite the important reforms introduced to improve support for young people with special educational needs and disabilities, the system is not working, they say, for every pupil. And that's why our SEND review is looking at how to make sure it is consistent all over the country, high quality and integrated across education, health and care. So the government there saying that effectively they know there is a problem there. They are doing their best to try to tackle it. But I think we get a very clear indication here of the real challenges and the difficulties that are pretty stark and unfair when it comes to the postcode lottery for children with special educational needs. Ali, thank you. Let's take a look now at the other stories making the news for you this morning. The Supreme Court is due to give a ruling later this morning on whether overnight carers should be paid the minimum wage for their whole shift. It comes as a care worker campaign to reverse a decision that carers are only entitled to payment when they need to be awake and not while asleep. Official figures show coronavirus has led to some of the highest ever television audiences in Britain. Boris Johnson's speech to the nation announcing the easing of the first lockdown in May was watched by 27.6 million people. The Queen's televised address last April was seen by just over 24 million viewers. Time now to take a look at the weather for you. Naz is uh, standing by. You're smiling again. Does that mean some sunshine? Yes, and this time the sunshine looks most likely across parts of the southeast where it was really quite dull yesterday. In fact, temperatures struggle to get above six degrees Celsius in Croma in uh, Norwich. So uh, we are going to be seeing higher temperatures, more in the way of sunshine there, but cloudier elsewhere. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. It is going to be mostly fine for the rest of this week, but there's going to be a fair amount of cloud around and it will be a little wet at times as well. In fact, for this morning, it's a murky start with lots of cloud across eastern parts of Scotland, northern England, the Midlands, central and southern England, down towards the West Country and for most of Wales, and quite cloudy too for Ireland and Northern Ireland. But elsewhere, there's some bright or sunny spells developing, particularly across East Anglia and the southeast. We'll see cloud amounts start to uh, peel back as the northeastly winds 
Melbourne's push through that cloud and there'll be sunshine and blue skies there, but it will feel quite chilly with those uh, northeasterly winds. Elsewhere, we hold on to quite a bit of cloud. The patchy light rain and drizzle will tend to fizzle away. There'll be some bright or sunny spells at times across Ireland and Northern Ireland too, and for western parts of Scotland, there will be a bit of brightness as well. The Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, has told Sky News this morning the government is looking at the possibility of using COVID certificates to open up sport, music and theatre venues from late June so arenas can return at full capacity without social distancing. It comes after the Prime Minister offered to host more games in the UK for the Euros tournament this summer. From the 21st of June, if, if all goes uh, to plan in the way that I described, we hope to get uh, people back in significant numbers. We're piloting the different things that will enable that to happen. Clearly, it will have to be done in a COVID secure way. So you would uh, expect and we'll be testing these things, things like uh, one way systems, things like masks, things like uh, hand hygiene and everything else. And as part of that, another thing that we are considering is a COVID certification. And we'll be testing whether we can use COVID certification to help uh, facilitate the return of sports. An education think tank claims it's found inconsistencies in the levels of support available to children with special educational needs in England. The Education Policy Institute says that access to services has become a postcode lottery. Joining me now is Tom Purser from the National Autistic Society. Good morning to you. Um, what were your first thoughts about the findings of this report? Well, I think the report is really shocking in its findings, but really what it does is support what we've been hearing from families and autistic children um, for years about that massive variability in access to support access to assessment and the different outcomes that autistic children are having across schools. But why is it happening? What, what in essence, is, is the crux of the, the, the issue? Well, we know that even before the, the pandemic, that there were lots of underlying inequalities in support at a school level, but also at a local authority level, a lot of variability in approaches from different local authorities as to how the support for autistic children was arranged, commissioned and, and followed through in schools. And actually, it's that level of inconsistency at a local level, both local authority and school level, that we need to see tackled. And actually, there's lots of things that can be done there that just aren't being done. What, what sort of things are you suggesting? Well, crucially, what we need to see from the government, and there's big opportunities to address this in the coming year for autistic children around the SEN review and the National Autism Strategy, to actually look at ensuring that the understanding of autism in schools is raised uh, amongst teaching staff and pupils themselves um, for, uh, for every school in the country. And we also need to see proper commissioning at a local authority level to make sure that the the right level and the consistent level of support for autistic young people and children is there wherever you are in the country to end this postcode lottery, to make sure that whatever an autistic child's needs are, because every autistic child is different, that they can have a consistent experience of education wherever they are. What has been your personal experience? Because you're the parent of an autistic child, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Um, in lots of ways, our story bears out this issue. We've actually had a very positive experience, but actually we have friends within the same county who have autistic children who've had wildly varying degrees of experience, some positive, some very negative, depending on just what part of the county they're in and what school their child's going to. The willingness to identify, assess and support needs varies from school to school. We've been very lucky, uh, but really that's been, a, that's been a matter of chance that our son was able to get good support. But also at times where things were difficult, um, we as uh, uh, people who've understood the system and work within it, um, have even we've had to fight and have found it complex and difficult to navigate. And actually for a lot of families, it is exhausting having to fight the system to get just an education for their child. And that is absolutely not right that families should be having to do that. What is it that people most complain about uh, in your circle that parents are, are saying to you that really makes their life so difficult? Well, I, 
unfortunately, it's a real range of things. And it goes right from the start. Obviously, diagnosis often follows before um, educational support in school. And actually, the battle to get a diagnosis in the first place can take years. Uh, the And then when it comes to it, you have to persuade uh, the, the local authority in the school to actually assess the child, uh, whether that's for support in school or for uh, education, health and care plan. And then even once that is secured, many parents find themselves having to fight for uh, the right sort of school for their child. It might not be in their local area. You have children going outside of area to be uh, to, to have their educational needs met, which isn't always the most appropriate thing. Um, and then even, even at that point, actually getting the funding there to follow through on the support that has been established in a plan um, can still be a huge battle. So uh, unfortunately, it, it goes right throughout the system. And then, of course, children change school as well very regularly and that that fight can start all over again once they move school so in all of this also transition planning from school to school is extremely important to maintain that consistency of support across a child's educational journey mm, it's an awful lot to think about um i wonder what effect the pandemic and, and lockdowns have had on, on the situation has that exacerbated uh, the, the problem with with people trying to access support yeah, the research that the National Autistic Society has carried out in our Left Stranded report um, looked at uh, autistic children and adults experiences during the pandemic and looking at education in particular we know that those underlying inequalities that existed before the pandemic have been deepened um, our research showed that um, seven out of ten uh, autistic children found it you know, difficult or impossible to complete online work and um, parents about half of parents said that their children's um, academic progress has suffered um, and 68% of autistic children said that their, um, their anxiety is worsened because of that disruption in routine that they've been experiencing during the pandemic. So there's lots of uh, big issues there. Equally, and I, I think it's important to recognise that for some autistic children, there has actually been a more positive experience during lockdown with homeschooling, coming into a, being able to work in a more predictable, controllable environment at home, but a huge variability around, around that as well. Some have had a very negative experience, some have had a more positive experience. And actually, it's really important that what the government do in their SEN review and in their national autism strategy is look at all of those experiences and identify what lessons can be learned from them about how the environment in the school needs to change, how teachers uh, need to be trained and supported to do what they do in schools and what local authorities need to be commissioning at a local level to give that consistency of support. OK, Tom Purser, thank you very much. And I'm sure people can turn to the National Autistic Society for help also. Thanks for speaking to us. Thank you. Scientists in Ireland have developed what they believe is the first ever early warning system to prevent whales colliding with ships. The acoustic monitoring devices will track the mammals and send back data on location in real time. From County Cork, our island correspondent Stephen Murphy reports. A voyage to eavesdrop on a hidden submarine soundscape. The south coast of Ireland is home to an abundance of whales, including huge fin whales, and humpbacks in the summer. That's the humpback. Oh, and the blue. But there are also busy shipping lanes, and ship strikes are a significant and underreported danger to whale populations. Now, a new monitoring project could help. This boy, launched nine kilometres off the County Cork coast, has a smart hydrophone that will listen in on the area's many sea mammals in real time. These waters are absolutely teeming with wildlife. So far, just on this short trip, we've seen a minke whale, common dolphins and grey seals. And the researchers on this vessel hope that they can learn new ways to protect these intelligent species by using artificial intelligence. The acoustic data will be used to train machine learning models to identify different species calls and ultimately could create a real-time detection system. We know very little about the rate of ship strike in Irish waters and how often whales are hit by ships. 
Um, but we also know very little about, you know, how loud our ships are. Orca Ireland has had an observer's app since 2017. So what we hope to do is to integrate um, our acoustics um, detections and the real-time information coming through into the app. And then that can pop up and it can notify mariners that there is a potential whale in the area. So what they can do is they can reduce their speed and then that will limit the impact of noise pollution, but it will also reduce the risk of ship strike. Apart from the scientific reward derived from the new technology, mariners here hope the project will help raise public awareness. What's really important about it is that, um, and this is something that we do as boat operators as well, is to be aware that what we do also affects the animals, but it's to make the general public aware that these animals are out there, number one, but to also respect them when we do go out there and not to disturb them and not to upset them. This is like, um, it's one of the good news stories in the midst of a pandemic where everything seems to be negative. Good news for the whales, good news for the, for the wildlife, yeah, absolutely. From the ocean to the cloud, AI and data analysis could be key to allow marine mammals and commerce exist side by side. Stephen Murphy, Sky News, off the Cork coast. Eight people, six of them Asian women, were killed this week in shootings at massage parlours in and around Atlanta in Georgia. A 21-year-old man has been charged with murder. There are concerns the attacks could have been racially motivated, with hate crimes against Asian people rising in recent months. How You Tam is the chair of End the Virus of Racism, an organisation dedicated to addressing systemic racism faced by people of East and Southeast Asian heritage. And she joins me now. Good morning to you. Um, first of all, tell us how much of a problem this issue is here in this country. Thank you, Gillian. Um, it's very common to think of um, crimes against East and Southeast Asian heritage people as something that is happening in the US alone, but we should not kid ourselves that this is also a problem in the UK. Um, and the virus of racism has been tracking, uh, has been tracking COVID related hate crime against our communities, which are obviously longstanding since the beginning of the pandemic. And we found that there's been a 300% increase in hate crimes against East and Southeast Asian communities. And these shoot up when lockdown is eased. Uh, we have seen that online, there has been a spikes of 900% global increase in traffic uh, in terms of hash hashtags that are racist, uh, against East and Southeast Asian communities and other hate crime motivated attacks there. Um, in terms of what we're seeing on the ground, what's less reported is that migrant workers um, and you know frontline workers, for example, uh, Filipino uh, healthcare workers disproportionately uh, feature in the death toll in terms of uh, people affected uh, in, the, in, in the NHS. Um, it's it's a very raw raw time for a lot of us. You know, a lot of us are scared to go out every day, um, and not to mention, I think, the daily triggering of these attacks and seeing the media response, seeing that um, while we've been trying to raise the awareness of the issue for months and months, it takes a crisis to um, to get our story on the news. Um, it, it's horrendous. Uh, I'm not surprised that you're you're a little bit emotional. Are, are you able to tell us some of the the stories that have been relayed to you, or, or even your personal experience? Sure. Um, we at End the Virus of Racism we work with a network of organisations, and that's one of our key aims is to mobilise a coalition of anti-racist and migrant justice groups, as well as East and Southeast Asian community organisations. Um, so some of the stories that we've heard about are um, sister, sister organisations that we work with supporting victims of domestic violence, um, whether they are in uh, re relationships with their abusers or they are domestic workers. Um, and a lot of these women become undocumented over the course of... Um, oh, they become undocumented and... So they become destitute as a result of becoming um, undocumented during the process of uh, the treatment. Um, I've, I've already spoken about how um, the NHS 
Filipino nationality workers in the NHS are disproportionately represented in the death toll. Um, as well as that, we have seen a spate of hate crime attacks. You know, for example, just last month, um, a lecturer in Southampton was attacked in broad daylight um, and, and sh shouted at, calling him China virus, which we know is a rhetoric that is been expanded by um, Donald Trump and um, it is it is also something that is latent in terms of uh, the racism that is uh, the racism that is sorry the, the racism is latent within British Parliament as well as our MP Sarah Owen um, has pointed out uh, numerous times and it's not been taken seriously um, as well as that I, I myself I'm from a takeaway background I have family members who work in the, uh, who are domestic workers, um, and of course, not least of all, loss of income um, and rise in racial abuse, but also um, the fear, of, you know, everyday takeaway workers, they do, there's this everyday racism, uh, racialized misogyny, um, class discrimination that they are faced, you know, and, um, yeah, it's, it's just extremely difficult to see news of different attacks on these small businesses and to know that the uh, while the hate crime incident reporting is it's going up, it, we're not seeing uh, correspond, corresponding sort of investment in community building. We're not seeing that these communities are being supported or that um, everyday racism in the media is being called out. So it's it's a very, very, um, the news over there affects our communities, undoubtedly. In terms of uh, the, the, the attacks that, that you speak of, what, what sort of support has there been from the police? Um, there are several fora that are set up um, with the Met Police to talk with East and Southeast Asian communities. Um, and, you know, and the virus of racism has been involved in some of these conversations. One of the first things we did in May was that we wrote to the Home Secretary and the Met Police uh, demanding accountability for the rise in hate crimes against East and Southeast Asian communities. And we have met with the Mayor of London several times as well as hosted community conversations. Um, and what we found is that there is a lot of willingness to meet, there's a lot of willingness to um, allow to some extent a co-design of the agenda but in terms of following up in terms of actual structural change this is this is far um that leaves much to be desired um and where we're where we're seeing in the us this crime being um this killing being framed as uh, it's 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 not racialized hate crime um it's all because the killer has a sexual addiction um, this is a severely blind way of looking, looking at the incident when it's clear that this is an episode um, in a longer standing history in which race, class, um, stigma towards people working in a, in a low wage industry, unprotected workers um, and gender, it, it all intersects together. So it's important to think intersectionally when we report oh, on these matters. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing what is a very shocking story with us this morning. Thank you.